Hi, everyone. I'm Bill Squadron, president of our energy policy, and welcome to our webinar today on new concepts for energy in 2021. I mean, we all know that change is coming, um, and on sort of everybody's mind is what can we look forward to in the energy sector? What kinds of ideas? What kinds of policies? Where can things be um, done in terms of consensus? What sorts of innovation is uh, really feasible? And we have a phenomenal panel here to discuss that today and really point us into the new year um, with analysis, insight, and ideas about what to look forward to uh, as we turn into 2021. Um, I want to thank all of you. I uh, hope you've all stayed healthy. Hope you're well. And thank you for joining us today and taking time out of your schedule to be part of our webinar series and to support what we're doing. Um, we will, uh, as we often do, um, create an online discussion that will uh, follow this um, webinar so that all of you will have the chance uh, to participate online in this dialogue about what to look forward to, what we should be supporting, um, what kinds of change we want to encourage uh, and we can look forward to in the new year. Um, I also want to thank our partners in this series, um, Grace Richardson Fund, National Grid, Con Ed, U.S. Grid, Bracewell, Schiff Harden, uh, API, and our series underwriting partner, BP, for their support. Um, and of course, thanks to all of you online for taking the time to join us. Um, I do want to point out that um, for the second um, half of the conversation, we will be opening it up to questions from all of you. Uh, on your dashboard on the right side, there's a questions bar. Um, just type in your question and submit it, and we will get to as many questions as we possibly can. Um, so as I said, um, Jeff Tannenbaum, Melanie Kenderdine, and Kate Frusher, we have a phenomenal panel to discuss what's coming into the new year. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Kate. Kate is the co-founder and managing director of The Clean Fight, which is a not, a, an accelerator for not-for-profits to scale them in the clean energy sector, as well as the head of New Energy Nexus New York, which is designed to focus on um, startup, early stage, and growth companies in the clean energy sector. So um, without any kind of further delay, I'm going to turn it over to Kate. Uh, welcome again and enjoy the conversation. Kate? Hi, everyone. I'm just going to ask the panelists to turn on their cameras. Great. Um, thanks, Bill. I'm honored to be here today with these incredible panelists. Um, and let me just start with a quick introduction. Uh, Jeffrey Tannenbaum is founder of Titan Grove, a private holding company focused on building and owning mission-driven businesses that promote uh, sustainable, healthy, and just capitalism. Jeff, Jeff also founded Fir Tree, Fir Tree Partners, a private global investment firm, and before that, he spent his career in the private equity industry at Kohlberg & Co., beginning as an analyst for Jeremy Kohlberg, considered the founder of the modern private equity industry. Uh, Jeff has served as board chairman of numerous public and private companies and founded and served as the chairman of S Power which he helped build into our nation's largest private solar utility. Uh, and through the Fir Trees Philanthropies, Jeff, among other things, uh, hosted President Obama's Energy Cabinet members for their 100-day planning retreat. Uh, he founded the not-for-profit PaceNation.org, which helped develop a new form of energy efficiency financing for buildings. Uh, and he recently launched the Clean Project to, de to deliver highly actionable clean energy job creation ideas to federal leaders something I hope we'll hear more about today. Um, we're also joined by Melanie Kenderdine, who is a principal of the Energy Futures Initiative and EMJ Associates, and a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council, a Washington think tank. Melanie served at the DOE from 2013 through early 2017, and as energy counselor to the secretary, and concurrently as the director of DOE's Office of Energy Policy and Systems Analysis, which covered analysis of policy development around energy innovation, climate change, energy security, energy systems and infrastructure, and North American energy integration. Prior to DOE, Melanie helped establish the MIT Energy Initiative um, and served as its executive, as its, its executive director. 
Uh, and she started the C3E Symposium Series, a joint MIT DOE program to support the careers of women in clean energy with cash prizes. Earlier, Melanie was Vice President of Washington Operations for the Gas Technology Institute and was a political appointee in President Bill Clinton's administration, where she served in several key posts at DOE, including, including as Senior Policy Advisor to the Secretary, Director of the Office of Policy, and Deputy Assistant Secretary for Congressional and Intergovernmental Affairs. Melanie is the longest serving political appointee in the history of the Department of Energy. Um, and she was named by National Journal as one of the top five most influential people in energy policy in 2014. And in, 2000, in, and in 2020, she was named by Ally as one of the top voices of energy in the sustainable energy category. And with that, we'll kick off our discussion. Um, so to start with, um, in just over a month, a whole new era in Washington begins. Uh, there's so much pent up energy and powerful ideas ready to rise after the holding pattern that we've been in over the past four years. So it's an incredibly exciting moment. Um, at the same time, there's a very tricky landscape to navigate with divided government, deep partisan tensions, and a raging pandemic that's necessarily dominating immediate time and resources. So let's explore the different ways impact can happen given this environment. Um, so to start with, I'd love for each of you to describe how you're working to help the Biden administration um, and how you're just generally feeling about the future of the clean energy economy come January 20th. Uh, I, I guess I'll start. Um, the, uh, uh, we have at the Energy Futures Initiative, um, uh, I've talked to members of the DOE transition team. As you said, Kate, I, I have 12 years as a political appointee at the Department of Energy, which is makes me the Methuselah of the um, the uh, uh, energy appointees, energy uh, department appointees. And um, so I've talked to, to members of the transition team um, about some very specific issues and some general issues, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, obviously, Secretary Moniz, who's, uh, who's the CEO of the Energy Futures Initiative, um, has had many, many conversations. Um, on on issues at at uh, the Department of Energy and um, and uh, in the energy space, but most people don't realize a huge uh, huge uh, mission of the Department of Energy is also nuclear weapons, and um, and uh, it helps being a nuclear physicist to advise on on the nuclear weapons con uh, 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 complex at DOE. So. So we've had a lot of conversations with individuals. Um, uh, we have provided uh, uh, input, uh, transition memos, what might executive orders look like, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but but uh, obviously, I'm a, I was a Democratic appointee. I will not uh, 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 say that I, I was unhappy with uh, President Biden, Vice or President-elect Biden uh, and the, his victory. We were very, very happy. Uh, uh, with the election results because it will re-engage the United States in global efforts to address um, climate change, which we think are very, very important. And um, so a lot of things that we've been doing, but but uh, uh, love to hear from Jeff on that too. So, yeah, how about you, Jeff? Sure, thanks, Kate and Melanie, and hello to everybody. Um, so, yeah, what, what we're doing to help is we launched something called the Clean Project, which is the first ever co-op for ideas for a clean economy. Um, and we pulled together about 80 advisory board members, former Obama uh, leaders, future Biden leaders, CEOs, environmental justice leaders, and think tank leaders to each come up with their singular best idea for creating jobs around a clean economy. And we're putting this up in a shareable database. So it's the first time you'll have under one tent ideas from NRDC, from EDF, from Rocky Mountain Institute, from Resources for the Future, and environmental justice organizations that federal leaders can access. So we're excited by that. And um, so that's been a big workload for us. And as soon as we hang up, I'll be reading through hundreds of ideas. In terms of my view of January 20th, 
I'm extremely optimistic. Uh, you know, for num number one, the clean economy has been muzzled for four years. The muzzle is off. And I think the voice that we're going to hear is going to be louder than we've ever heard for a variety of reasons. Number one, the public uh, care about climate now is, is substantially uh, more engaged and louder than it was 12 years ago. Um, number two, and probably something a lot of people aren't focusing on, but in, in terms of the general public, the people that Biden is appointing now are in substantially larger positions of power. So Carol Browner and John Holgen 12 years ago, extraordinary individuals, but limited in their capacity of power. When you have a former Secretary of State like John Kerry, and then when you have appointments that have essentially economic power, like a Janet Yellen, who's a climate believer, a Brian Deese in charge of the National Economic Council, um, we're going to be able to make a lot more progress. The analogy I would make is that you know, a, 10 years ago, when you met with the head of sustainability of a Fortune 500 company, it was, it was a public relations position. They had no power. Now they're starting to sit at the table with the CFOs. This is what you're going to be seeing at the White House come January 20th. Big change. Yeah, that is really exciting, Jeff. So just thinking about things sequentially, what are the immediate things you think the administration can do to have impact before worrying about the complexity of legislative strategy? Um, so Melanie, I guess first to you, what's top of the list in your mind for the things that could be done by executive action and, and why are they the top of your list? Um, the, uh, the, uh, we ha actually have been thinking, as I said, a lot about what could happen right away vis-a-vis uh, -vis executive order. And, um, and I would divide uh, the executive orders and powers and things in relative to clean energy into domestic, international, and, and security issues. And, and from a domestic perspective, we, we obviously, we now have a, uh, 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 nominations or announcements. Uh, uh, not all of them are nominations. John Kerry doesn't have to be, uh, Senate confirmed. Okay. But, but, um, uh, announcements on who will be running both the domestic, uh, climate effort and the international climate effort. And I would start obviously getting back into the Paris Agreement is going to be the number one thing that uh, that a President Biden can do. And uh, I do think that John Kerry is going to have to do additional work um, in that regard and, and demonstrating that we are serious about it because we have not been participating in those discussions in a meaningful way for the last uh, four years. And so internationally, obviously, that's one of the very first things that, that should happen. From a domestic perspective, um, and, and Jeffrey mentioned this, uh, the jobs aspect um, at the Energy Futures Initiative, um, actually we did it when we were in the government um, at DOE, Secretary Moniz and I, uh, we launched a, a, an energy jobs report and and uh, and it was needed to get a much more granular understanding of energy jobs. Uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics at that point in time said that there were 500 solar jobs and there were 250,000 because the solar jobs are construction jobs. And so they go into BLS's construction category. And, and the Trump administration discontinued doing that jobs and job survey. We picked it up at the Energy Futures Initiative. What uh, we just issued the five year report, energy jobs are created in the economy at twice the rate of uh, general jobs in the economy. And so one of the first things I would do as, as President, Joe, uh, President Biden is because of COVID and the very precarious position of our economy and our jobs is, is work, uh, uh, get the assistant to the president or whatever uh, 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 Gina McCarthy is, what her title is going to be to coordinate a federal interagency task force to identify and implement uh, climate and clean energy policies and programs with a focus on jobs. 
and and uh, if you can get that kind of response in the economy to energy jobs and get clean energy at the same time, I think that that would be a huge priority. And one other, uh, uh, two other things I would say, three, okay, energy infrastructure modernization, I think is, is a critical thing that the administration should focus on. Um, when we were at the Department of Energy, we did a, a quadrennial energy review. Uh, Vice President Biden came to the rollout of that, and that installment was about energy infrastructure. And, and we need uh, a significant energy infrastructure program, start organizing the agencies of the government, again, to focus on climate resilient and infrastructure, hugely important and um and uh um on a a supply chain global su supply chain basis the administration could very very easily focus on two things um our lng exports to the rest of the world our, our have increased by uh by 900 percent in the last three years 78 percent of those exports are going to oecd countries those are our allies and trading partners. Being cognizant of those supply chains and making sure that they are protected and supported because those are our, our allies and trading partners, I think rises in importance. It's not all about oil and the Straits of Hormuz anymore from a, a security perspective. Um, and uh, that's something else I would focus on. And then finally, the administration needs to, it's another supply chain issue, the metals, minerals, and processes that are needed for clean energy technologies. There should be a very significant focus on the security of those supply chains as well. And also what can we do domestically? So in that regard, so. Great, thank you, Melanie, that's great. Jeff, beyond uh, executive action, I'm, I'm wondering what you think the administration and frankly all of us should be gearing up to do. Um, it feels like there's an opportunity to bring forward some fresh and creative new ideas. Um, and I'm wondering if you think a bottom-up kind of inclusive process is feasible. Thank you, Kate. So yeah, I do think a bottom-up uh, approach is feasible and that's, that's what a number of us are leading. So. The, the the beauty is there's so many good ideas out there and uh, the problem is it's it's like a chinese restaurant when you go in the menu so big what do you what do you order so you know with the people who are members of of the oep network i would, I would encourage a number of, of paths in terms of how these bottoms up ideas can happen you know first and foremost you know having spoken to a lot of uh, ex obama folks and transition team members People want ideas, and they want ideas particularly around clean economy, job creation, and environmental justice. Um, their number one ideas are going to be ideas that come from friends and colleagues they respect. So you, the people that are on the call here, uh, you know, you have relationships with people. I would encourage you to forge those relationships uh, and deliver ideas in very simple, digestible form because that's what that's the number one. Uh, way ideas are going to get happened. They're going to be vetted from people that they respect. Number two, uh, obviously welcome uh, all of you in to, you know, take a look at the Clean Project. It's C L E E N Project.org, and if you want to participate in in in, uh, in the project and put an idea up uh, uh, in the database, we would obviously welcome it. But yeah, bottoms up ideas are welcome. Uh, the transition team is very very focused on bringing in industry, uh, public-private partnerships, and working in collaboration with folks outside of uh, government. It's been stressed in many, many calls with them. I guess building off of that, Melanie and Jeff, whichever one of you wants to jump in, what do you view as the soft targets, the easy lifts that can make meaningful change? Um, the, the, I don't know that in, in uh, a divided country, okay, as we are, uh, <clears throat> that that uh, any target is easy. Um, let me throw out a couple of ideas that uh, and and things that I have been thinking about and others in our organization. 
Um, and and this this one has the added benefit of I think actually helping to heal some of the political divides that we're dealing with right now, and which which are in part I think rural versus urban divides. And and in rural America, <clears throat> the the what I've been thinking about is a program for energy efficiency and resilience in city, county, municipal buildings in rural areas. The rural areas have lost their tax base. They can't afford to do it themselves. Uh, investing in that brings jobs back to rural America that has lost jobs. It, it, efficiency and resilient is, resilience is good for the climate and the environment. And and it's it's um it's it's creating jobs in places of the country and perhaps reinvigorating some of those areas uh, uh, in ways that um, that meet some of our needs. And so so that's one area I think is very important. I don't know if it's an easy lift. Um, getting money right now is going to be tough, but there is an energy bill that's getting ready to pass out of both the House and Senate and the conference agreement. Um, another thing in that agreement, um, there are uh, in the in the the bill that I've seen so far, it is hugely increasing the the uh, authorization levels of funding for both the fossil energy office and the energy efficiency and renewables office in equal amounts. So it's they're trying to build the coalitions that they need, but in the fossil energy office is a large program for deployment of CCUS. And I know that it's CCUS is a problem for a lot of people in the environmental uh, space, but I have looked at EIA has 10 regions of the country. Um, I can't find the basis of their regions, but they've divided it up into 10 regions. One of those regions is 78% gas and coal generation. Almost all of the regions have at least 40%, 49% New England, 49% gas generation. Most of the rest is nuclear generation in New England. And most of the regions, wind and solar are five percent or less. If we are going to immediately address climate change, which I think we have to act now, or or we cannot uh, achieve uh, mid-century goals, um, we need CCUS um, in for that power generation. You can't switch out those systems fast enough to address climate change as rapidly as we need to. And so, so I think that is another area. I think hydrogen is the fuel of the future, and we should be focusing on that as well. So, right. And so long duration storage. Thank you. Yeah. That's right, Jeff. Yeah. So, um, I feel like a little bit like Santa Claus today, <laughs> and I, I say that because December 11th was our due date for initial submissions, and we have 200 ideas. Mm -hmm. And the, the focus was what are low cost, no cost actions. So I'm, I'm going to rattle off 10 or so what I'll call soft targets that uh, um, we're pretty excited about. Number one, which could be the biggest, um, is procurement, federal procurement. So the federal government is the number one purchaser of fuel, number one purchaser of cars, number one purchaser of food, number one owner of buildings, and number one owner of land in our country. Right. And what can be done in terms of um, rules, rules around procurement are, are absolutely fantastic. So, for um, example, you could require transparency rules around um, uh, life cycle costs of products that are purchased by the federal government mm -hmm. or suppliers of the federal government. Um, you could require certain um, diversity um, hiring practices um, you could really um, what catalyze changes in what i'm calling heavy industries like steel concrete and cement through the federal government 
food is one of the biggest contributors to greenhouse gas emissions. And people don't talk about it because politicians don't want to essentially talk about us changing our eating habits. So it's taboo. Uh, it's, it's the most untalked about greenhouse gas emission imaginable. Well, the federal government's cafeterias feed more than, I think, 250,000 meals every single working day. Uh, if they change their rules around the food that they're feeding um, federal staff, it would catalyze the plant-based movement in a dramatic way, which we need to do to bring down the costs of many of these um, areas. So number one, federal procurement. Number two, um, what we're calling partnerships. So this is low to no cost. So partnerships uh, involve public-private partnerships. So that's the federal government doing things in conjunction with corporations. So something we haven't had in the past four years is the bully pulpit. Well, imagine if if Biden pulled together leading Fortune 500 companies uh, to talk about beating the Paris Climate Accord by 10 years or 20 years and to drag additional committers to that event and then measuring it every year. Well, those things are definitely in the cards. So we've got public-private partnerships. We have state and federal partnerships. So there are many things that can be led by the federal government that will catalyze state action. And then we have transnational partnerships. So these, these, are, these could be around heavy industry. It could be around transparency of consumer goods many, many things that can be done. These are low to no cost initiatives that can really move um, move the world much faster. The past four years, we've relied on private industry and just states. Well, if we have the federal government leading, we can move everybody a little faster. The third area is workforce training. Um, tremendous amount can be done in this arena, you know, especially given the importance of unemployment. There are a lot of grant programs that could be geared up, not lots of money, little little grants to small businesses to help subsidize training and hiring people um, can go a very, very, very long, uh, long way. Transparency. Um, transparency rules and regs. So give you some examples. Um, you go to the EU, there are certain countries in the UK, when you look at, when you walk past the real estate brokerage house, you'll literally see a, a mile per gallon standard on a house. We don't have that here. Um, so we have transparency standards that would be required on residential listings, um, as well as um, resiliency standards required on uh, any, any purchase or sale of a commercial building would require, um, you know, insurance companies would then require that these buildings be built more resilient for whether it be a hurricane, flood, or wildfires. FERC, a lot of little ideas to help FERC move along. FERC is turned into a telecom company, even though it's considered a utility, but it's not delivering on broadband for all the way it needs to. Uh, we've got a number of ideas that literally involve one or two staff members at FERC with telecom expertise to dramatically speed up the, uh, uh, the time it, it's going to take to get broadband out to our nation. So. You know, those are just a few a few examples. There's a lot, a lot of low-hanging fruit that requires no to little money that we can move on January 20th that uh, that we're very excited by. Yeah, that's that's really interesting, Melanie. As we get into the harder stuff, um, I, I'm curious what your thoughts are about the types of ideas that are likely to gain traction in Congress. You you touched on this before, but given your experience, what mm -hmm is the the sort of the Republican side uh, in Congress most likely to latch on to, you think? Uh, CCUS, <laughs> I think, I mean, that that's one of the, the, uh, the uh, many of the things that create jobs. Uh, I, I think, uh, although I, I can't speak for Republican members of Congress, okay? So that's, that's uh, uh, but I think that, that the things that we can support, we can get, we are very, very interested in things that build coalitions. And, and I think that the, the election results demonstrated that that's what we're going to have to do. That's why I like the rural, the rural uh, focus. Um, 
uh, one of the points Jeffrey raised, uh, uh, getting universal broadband access. I'm in New Mexico, uh, kids in rural New Mexico. I'm on a governor's task force on grid modernization here. Kids in rural New Mexico can't go to school. Okay, I mean, it's that, it's that kind of thing. Um, uh, uh, so I think, I think things that build out new industries, okay, and, and when I, when I say CCUS, it's, I, I mentioned the power generation, it's hugely important for industry, and industry is much more difficult to decarbonize than the power sector, and, and we don't have the technologies, you need high quality process heat, you need a fuel, and so the things that we can do to help create new industries or support existing industries, I think are things that we could probably get support for. Um, CCUS is one of them. Building a hydrogen infrastructure is another. Uh, Jeffrey mentioned uh, uh, methane emissions. And, and I should have said this in executive actions, reinstate the methane rule that we did in the Obama administration uh, uh, on, on oil and gas, uh, methane leaks. But I would say to that, and this is going to be difficult, uh, Jeffrey mentioned food. Numbers for methane emissions, 30% are from, these are EPA numbers, 30% are from oil and gas. 62% are from agriculture and services, landfills and, and water treatment. Okay, so much, much larger. We what we focused on oil and gas, on methane emissions because it's easier. Reinstitute that that um, that uh, rule that we worked on, but but also start working on how you can make a product, how you can monetize the methane from from uh, certainly from oh. landfills and services harder from agriculture, but I still think you could do it. Develop renewable gas, for example. Um, and, and I think if you could create products and in industries out of that, you're much more likely to get bipartisan support. And, and so those are a few things I think that we, we might think about uh, that could get uh, bipartisan support. And you've got to be cognizant, you need to be making new industries and not stranding the workers from the conventional oil and gas industries. CCUS, the skill sets are very, very um, uh, similar for, for pipelines and, under, and subsurface uh, knowledge engineering, uh, very, very similar. So you could start translating uh, uh, conventional uh, energy jobs into those jobs. And, and um, I would say uh, one other thing that I can't remember, but it was important, at any rate, <laughs> Ask it. I'll, I'll jump in and interrupt you when I that. remember what the, the last point was that I was going to say. <laughs> Great. So. Jeff, I'm curious on your perspective on this. I know you've done a bunch of bipartisan uh, work before in terms of gaining energy independence. But everyone's also given... frozen for me. Oh, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. I can hear so you Jeff... now. Yeah, yeah. You, you broke up. Yeah. Okay. Um, Jeff, I'm curious. If, if you want to comment on the last qu last question about bipartisanship, but also given your background in finance, I'm wondering what you think government can most impactfully do to help drive the market and provide incentives. Um, and also just as somebody who works with early stage companies uh, where VC isn't quite the right fit all the time, um, looking beyond government, what kinds of financial products do you think are needed to help with the energy transition? Sure. Yeah, so thank, thanks, Kate. So I don't spend a lot of time thinking about bipartisan legislative solutions because I just look at the history of it and it's been so, I mean, other than naming statues and monuments off of uh, about people, no, nothing, no bills have really passed. So I, I focus on, you know, what I believe the Biden administration could do, assuming no flipping of the Senate in uh, Georgia. So mo moving to your question on, on financial products, there's a lot of interesting financial innovation that can happen that I think can um, accelerate the clean economy. And I'll give you some examples. 
Um, we had we had a program under the Obama administration that I'm sure Melanie will remember called, I think it was Build Back Better Bonds. Um, so mm -hmm. the the municipal bond market, you know, where we, we can buy as investors tax-free bonds is great because we don't pay taxes. The problem is there's a limited number of buyers, so it's a, it's just a relatively small market. Um, so the Build Back America bond idea is is pretty straightforward, which is municipalities can issue bonds but they're taxable so all of a sudden the market size grows exponentially they have to pay more in rate because they're taxable but the concepts that we've been looking at recycle that increase in rate that essentially that tax back to the municipality so it's essentially revenue neutral um, those monies could be used to finance municipal, municipal infrastructure around the country, blue and red states, rural, non-rural. Um, I think it could be a really, really good kickstart. Another area is um, uh, one of the ideas that came in is an opt-in climate infrastructure bank. And uh, I wasn't aware of this, but virtually all the states in America have essentially um, what was kickstarted by the federal government, a water resiliency revolving credit fund, um, which are essentially individual state banks. And um, through a good bit of research, it be, it's pretty clear that those banks can be used not only for water resiliency, but also for clean energy. Because by reducing pollution, you're avoiding, uh, by reducing air pollution, particulates in the air, you're, you're avoiding water pollution. So um, there's some really cool ideas around combining these state banks into one national bank uh, that I think is doable. And then the um, there are a lot of opportunities in the investment tax credit area. This is one of the few areas where there is a feeling that there could be some bipartisan support because it's about um, tax reduction. And you can go through a laundry list of, you know, extending the existing ones, you know, longer solar and uh, solar and wind, extending it to batteries, um, extending it beyond to um, energy efficiency, to a number of soil, uh, soil uh, sequestration strategies, as well as around new industries. You know, for example, in Sioux Collins State, they, there are a number of startups that are focused on um, building insulation made out of essentially wood substrates, which is a really interesting idea because it's permanent sequestration of carbon. Um, the, the businesses are growing, but you know, could they be benefited from IPC credits? Absolutely. And there's dozens of examples um, like that. So Kate, that, that's a, those are a few examples of some of the you know, financial market innovations that could help. Right. Melanie, you wanted to jump in? Yeah, yeah. I remember two seconds after Jeffrey started talking, I remembered what I was going to say. Of course, the the um, something that we have been looking at, and we look, we just did a, a California study and and model based on this, is is ex utilization of existing rights of way. And and yes, and the the and I can't there there everyone knows how difficult it is to permit things, but if you're going to electrify a lot more and you're going to modernize your grid and some of the things we're talking about, you could increase your electricity demand by sixty percent. You've got to be able to site things and transmission lines, et cetera, et cetera. And the the I have I, I'm very, very worried again about jobs and the railroads. Fifty percent of the railroads business coal. It's coal and coal's going away. And so how can the railroads cre uh, uh, monetize their they've got rail tracks everywhere, you know, and and how can how can they monetize those? And how can we use those existing rights of way to speed up the siting of additional infrastructure that we need for a clean energy future? I think it's hugely important. And and the the uh, something else. I mean, it's it's all about permitting. We looked at New England. 
New England, as I said, it's 49% gas generation, uh, uh, less than 5% wind and solar, and the rest is nuclear. A little bit of oil, very little. And, but they have very, very, and they have no sequestration uh, options, not in the region. They don't have good uh, 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 subsurface uh, aquifers or anything like that. And, and, and so we looked, and they're very space constrained. So I did a, a reference frame on how many wind turbines, offshore wind turbines that they would need in order to replace their gas and nuclear. It was 2,183 offshore wind turbines. Okay, we all know what happened with Cape Wind, how long that took. Speeding up permitting is incredibly important for the clean energy transition. And, and I think that, a, and that's a tough issue. You ask about tough issues, that's a really tough issue. And, but there are things out there, again, these rights of ways, railroads I looked at, the CCUS study we looked at in California, we, we uh, uh, modeled the infrastructure that you would need, the pipeline infrastructure along existing rights of way, um, so you could take advantage of those. If you're not using an oil pipeline that's crossing the country anymore, how can you use that for transmission? And I really think it's a tough issue, um, and it's something that we really need to be thinking about if we're going to transition rapidly. So, Great. Um, I, I want to make sure there's time for questions from the audience. Um, so let's let's turn over to that. Thank you very much, Kate. Thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you, Melanie. Uh, we will jump right into the questions, but I do want to mention to our audience, uh, if you'd like to submit one, again, it is on the right side of your screen on the GoToWebinar dashboard. Just type that in and we'll get through as many as we have time for. The questions are already coming in. The first question here is from Bruce Bailey. What is the status of upgrading the country's transmission system, particularly with regard to long distance delivery of clean electricity from sunny and windy regions to the load centers on the east and west coast? Melanie, you want to take that one? Um, yeah, the, the, uh, the, I, I, I actually just provided the setup for, for uh, uh, upgrading transmission and, um, and the, it is not unrelated to the issue of, of uh, upgrading the infrastructure itself, which we do need and we need to speed it up. Um, uh, but the current market structure with the RTOs and the ISOs and NERC is highly problematic in, uh, for wheeling power around the country. And and we have a and we have three interconnection regions in the electricity markets. We have capacity markets, capacity markets, uh, uh, and those are the numbers you're seeing about wind and solar. Um, uh, the 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 capacity markets are are um, are incentivizing wind and solar because it's cheap, but that's without storage. Storage is not cheap. And so, so the current market structure was basically put in place. I just had a phone call uh, right before this with somebody that I work with um, uh, uh, on the Hill Senate Energy Committee and mentioned this to him that the, the market structures we have in place were basically designed in the late 90s. And you think about the technologies that we have developed since the late 90s. Okay, when I started at DOE, we didn't have email. Okay, so so um, the the technology changes that have been taking have taken place, and wind and solar, uh, uh, in particular, and the cost declines. If you could more easily wheel power around the country, you could use a lot more wind and solar. That's what the question is. Basically, how can we do that? The current market structure does not enable that. It inhibits that. And so I think, and we're the person I talked to today, we were both victims. Those were vicious, vicious fights in the late 90s. But I think we need to revisit our electricity market structures again. I think that you could use a lot more 
wind and solar if it was if it was easier to wheel it from one side of the country to the to the other you'd still need a fuel okay because uh because uh battery storage right now is four hours and and uh uh we looked at we did a study of california and there were 90 days in one year with little to no wind so 10 days in a row uh that's a an in innovation area that we need to look at but I think we need to, it's time to revisit electricity market structures and, and look at them in, and in ways that will enable the technologies that we now have, especially wind and solar, and, um, and, uh, and, uh, and do, do so in ways that, that enable much greater use of that. Right now it's, it's hurting it, so. Perfect. Thank you, Melanie. Our next question here is from Michael Lubell. Uh, what kinds of training programs would be most beneficial to workers in the fossil fuel industries who are almost certainly going to be displaced by a greener economy? Yeah. Um, let me let me think about that. You know, it it it's. You know, this one I struggle with because the um, the job losses in Virginia, right, are, are going to be replaced by job gains typically in, in West Virginia by job gains in other states. And so the struggle I have with a lot of this is I think the reality is there will over time be a migration of, of people. I don't want I don't want to give a, um, a superficial answer and say we're going to retrain you know, West Virginia coal miners to install solar because uh, there's not going to be a massive amount of solar installed in um, in West Virginia. So I, I really don't, you know, I don't have a great answer for you other than to say that, you know, what we've seen in our country is a pretty um, flexible workforce. Uh, we've seen it over the past, you know, 100 years. Folks move to where the opportunities are and I think that's I think that's ultimately what you're going what you're going to see. So as we build out more and more solar and wind in um, in places like Texas, Florida, um, I think you'll continue to see you know growths in 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 the populations in in those states. But I don't I don't I, offhand I don't have a, a great answer for you on that question. Maybe Melanie does. <laughs> If I could say something, um, we have formed uh, the Labor Energy Partnership, the Energy Futures Initiative, and the AFL-CIO. Um, uh, and the AFL-CIO has incredible apprenticeship and training programs. And, um, and in that partnership, one of the big things that we are looking at is offshore wind development. And I mentioned that earlier, the, the need for offshore wind in, in, uh, in New England. But but uh, there uh, we are also looking at new industries that could be created uh, and should be created for for um, for uh, cleaner energy and and I've mentioned CCS many times those skill sets are very uh, shared with the oil and gas industry so if you can transition those jobs. But I believe in the new energy bill uh, that the House and Senate are working on that there were Davis-Bacon uh, provisions applied to the wind and solar jobs, okay, which is important. Most, most solar jobs have been in construction, and those typically are not are not uh, union jobs. And so, so getting Davis-Bacon applied to that and I'm I'm remembering this off the top of my head, so it's surely going to be wrong. But wind and solar, um, uh, uh, water, energy, et cetera, et cetera, carbon dioxide removal, direct air capture is going to be another big growth area. If you want to get to net zero, you need carbon dioxide removal. Davis Bacon treatment on that, and I believe the other area for Davis Bacon uh, uh, was in grid modernization. And I would say another area where training would be needed is in hydrogen, both hydrogen production 
and and uh, the infrastructure that you need, new infrastructures that you might need for uh, hydrogen uh, uh, distribution, uh, transmission and distribution. And so uh, focusing on some of those uh, specific areas where you know you're going to get Davis-Bacon treatment, um, uh, what training is needed in that, utilize the AFL-CIO training infrastructure, which is uh, significant, and, and look at where some of these industries of the future that are being created are going. And, um, and I would add one other, uh, domestic mining uh, uh, for uh, the, the metals and minerals that we are going to need for clean energy technologies. Um, uh, I, I, have, I have concerns about long duration storage, grid scale long duration storage, but lithium ion batteries for vehicles are terrific, okay? But uh, most of the lithium in the world is in South America. The cobalt is in uh, a Democratic Republic of Congo. And, um, and uh, we need to be thinking about what we can do here. Wind turbines and electric vehicles require huge amounts of copper. And, and we don't need to be importing that copper. We have a lot of, uh, of the resource here. So that's another area where I think you could create jobs and job training could be developed. So, well, right. what, 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 what I just want to make one clarification. What, what I, what I just about what I said. There, there's a short-term problem and then there's a long-term problem. So, it, it, in, in, in my opinion, the short-term problem is coal is going away very, very quickly. And there's a plus or minus last count, 50,000 coal miners. So it's very small more people employed in the bowling industry than as coal miners. Those 50,000 jobs are easily replaceable in the short term with things like uh, retrofits of schools, federal and state buildings, as well as um, taking coal-fired plants and converting them to clean energy because they're sited perfectly in terms of, you know, they're on, they're on the grid. The longer term job issue is what do you do with all these oil and gas jobs, right? And though the good news about that is we have time, right? There, there's job, and that's also the bad thing. So okay, um, they, uh, you know, they're not going away in the next year or two. You know, we're talking a decade plus. So we've got time for transition. We've got time for good planning. We have time to train people. We have time for people to move if need be, because in the locales they're in, there may not be a job, and for the next generation to be ready for it. So I think I think with proper planning, we're in relatively good stead. Uh, because it's it's a small number of near-term jobs we have to replace. It's a large number of longer-term jobs, and we've got a good bit of time for the planning. Thank you very much, Jeff. If I could say one thing on that, on on, on that, Jeffrey, the the there's a big multiplier in these jobs. Okay, and and you mentioned coal jobs, and I the the, the declines in coal generation in the last five years have been enormous. But the, the multiplier includes something like what I said, the rail jobs, okay, and and uh, and just you know the local, you know what what is the multiplier effect like 3.7 for every job in coal? There's going to be 3.7 uh, associated jobs. So so we've got to think about those too, and and um, and I agree kind of with your time scales are are it's going to take a long time. To replace our 273 million uh, light duty vehicles with EVs, I, I looked it up the other day. 273 million light duty vehicles on the road now. Yes, and and that's in the U.S. globally. It's unbelievable. So so it's gonna it's a longer term proposition, uh, uh, and it's why we need efficiency uh, standards. That's another thing that we need to reinstate efficiency standards on vehicles and appliances. So. Thank you, Melanie. Thank you, Jeff. Mm -hmm. uh, looks like we have time for one or two more questions. A uh, question here from Doug Coplow uh, for Jeff. Uh, with large asset managers like BlackRock committing to increased integration of climate into their oversight of investments, are there two or three things they can do with regards to transparency that would pressure carbon intensive firms in their portfolios to change more rapidly? Yeah, um, I think there's a number of things. Uh, number one, they could require companies that they're going to invest in to disclose in their annual reports and 10Ks risks associated with climate. 
you know, the SEC has not, you know, this is something that SASB and a number of organizations like SASB has recommended. Um, the SEC has not adopted it. Um, but look, BlackRock owns roughly 5% of literally every publicly listed company in the United States, including fossil fuel companies. And if that disclosure was required, um, it would it would lead to change. And then they can go a step further and um, essentially do carbon disclosures and commit to science-based targets and then go a step even further and and uh, push as many of their companies to sign on to some of the uh, COP24 targets um, that many companies have signed on to. If you read about you know, some of the recent announcements, the lead, uh, really big tech has led in this arena, uh, Amazon, Google, and Apple. And um, more pressure from BlackRock would be really helpful because if you look at it, you know, Larry Fink about a year ago wrote a very enlightened letter Right, but it was just that it was a letter. When you peel back the onion in terms of the resolutions that they voted down, they vote down virtually virtually all climate resolutions at the board level as uh, shareholders, and they own every company virtually regardless of environmental record. So you know they 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 have the power to take leadership, and these are the types of things that I think that they should you should lead on. Thank you very much. Let's jump into one last question here. A uh, question from Bill Schaefer. How does the government avoid picking winning and losing technologies and encourage creative solutions for shared greenhouse gas mitigation goals? How does the government uh, avoid picking winners and losers? Um, let, let me say that that I think, and, and this is the approach that we take in our analysis, it's actually supported by the data and the analysis is that we need all of the above solutions, particularly in the time scales that Jeffrey described. These things are not going to happen overnight, but we need deep reductions in CO2 and methane emissions overnight. And so, so when you're talking about something like climate policy, I'm, and, you, and you have one and you are incentivizing certain things, you are in fact picking winners and losers. Um, uh, uh, but if you need all of the above with different technology solutions for them, and I can give you an example, again, the, the, uh, the uh, wind and solar uh, uh, and 90 days with no wind in, in um, in uh, California, we also looked at Texas. Texas, wind capital of the country, also had 90 days with no wind, different times of the year. But incentivizing innovation in long duration storage becomes very, very important for that. A region of the country that has 78% coal and gas generation and we need to rapidly reduce our emissions, incentivizing CCUS uh, uh, for that region is very important. And so I think you need different solutions for different regions, but a, a climate policy and climate objectives in general implies that you're going to have to do certain things as a matter of policy, as a matter of investment, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so, I, I don't want to say that's picking winners and losers. It's picking a high level policy that you are trying to meet, acknowledging that there are a range of different solutions for meeting that and incentivizing them appropriately. So. Yeah, I would, uh, I think that's an excellent answer. I, I would just add that I think the, to Melanie's point, the, the government's job is to come up with an overall objective. And I think the way the government best avoids picking winners and losers is the government engages in public-private partnerships so it, which would include even an investment tax credit where private capital is being mobilized with the help of the federal government and why i say that is private capital can pivot much better right if, if a business plan is not working i mean every startup <laughs> but and kate knows this well she's led a lot of startups they look really different in year three than, than the initial 
um, business plan. So having the flexibility to move is really critical. And that's why I think these, these are ideas that really germinate with a catalyzing by maybe federal monies and a federal program, right. but they enable private companies to pivot. And then I, the only other point I'd add is that you, you have to allow for failure. You know, the Solyndra right. case is, is kind of a joke in my mind because you, you can't and you can't and anticipate that someone's going to put out you know tens or hundreds of billions of dollars and not lose money. So it just has to be assumed that there are going to be winners and losers, and, that, and that's that's okay uh, as long as you have more more winners than losers. Hey, Jeffrey, if I could say on Cylinder, we suffered the slings and arrows from the failure of Cylinder when we were at DOE, and the DOE loan program, its success rate and failure rate is much better than in the private sector. And I totally agree. We need to we need to accommodate failure and not make it look like if you're investing these kinds of monies and and with a a policy objective of of mitigating climate change, which is an existential threat uh, to the U.S. and the world, um, uh, and and uh, and and you can't accommodate failure uh, in innovation space. It's you know. And it's not it's, I don't know, yeah. it's not better. It's like it's like firing Michael Jordan because he was shooting 70% from the field. It's like yeah. <laughs> that's, right. you know, right. no, that's success. Well, with the NBA starting next week, that'll be a good time. That'll be a good transition to right. uh, you know, unfortunately, we could continue this conversation clearly for another hour or more, and there are a lot of questions, but we do want to be mindful of everyone's schedule. I'm so grateful to uh, Jeffrey, Melanie, Kate, all of you for this phenomenal discussion. And I will say that a lot of the points that you raised are um, at the beginning of our schedule for webinars in the new year, public-private partnerships, as Jeff talked about, hydrogen, um, long-duration storage. These are going to be um, areas that we're going to dive into in detail in webinars in the new year. Um, you know, Jeff's uh, clean project, just commend all of you to the work that he's doing to uh, identify innovative ideas um, and to uh, provide a kind of strong, coherent messaging around them. And the Energy Futures Initiative, the kinds of studies, reports, analysis, recommendations that are coming out of Melanie's organization, I would commend to everyone. And you can also find them on our website at Our Energy Policy through the Our Energy Library. And those of you who are working in this space, which is most of you on this webinar, um, I really encourage you to go to our site. That library is really the most well-indexed and comprehensive storage, um, a resource of um, articles, reports, studies, papers, everything regarding energy issues uh, that's out there. And so really encourage you to use it. And the last thing I'll do is encourage everyone to follow this conversation with discussion online. We're gonna open up a discussion you know, through the holidays. So, you know, when you get a few minutes, but we're very eager to hear your thoughts um, in response and observation on what we heard from um, Jeff, Melanie, and Kate today about um, what to look for in the new year. And uh, we're going to publish a summary and report of both this webinar and those conversations, um, which we'll then distribute. So please go to the site, register, get involved. Um, thank you so much for taking your time. Thanks, of course, to Jeff, Melanie, and Kate. Thanks to our partners and sponsors. Um, and most of all, wish all of you uh, a very happy, healthy holidays, successful new year. We've all been through um, a time that's indescribable, so I won't try to put words, with, words to it, but we're heading into a new year, and uh, I wish for all of you uh, the best possible happy and healthy year ahead. Thanks again, and um, stay well. Bye-bye. Thank you.